Our next presenter is Ted Blank, our NASA ambassador, co-founder of the Fountain Hills Astronomy Club and Dark Sky Association board member. He's going to share information regarding the Apollo missions and how mankind actually got to the moon. Ted, take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Ted Blank. I'm a NASA Solar System ambassador and an amateur astronomer. And I'm very pleased to be able to share with you today the story of Project Apollo, how mankind got to the moon. I want to express my great thanks to the many organizations and people who helped me accumulate the information that I present here. Now, if your brother or brother-in-law believes that the moon landings were faked because he read it on the internet, here's some information you can use to maybe convince him otherwise. First of all, there were six landings, not just one. Uh, the Russians certainly would have brought this up by now. And if we were going to fake it, why would we do it six times? Just fake it once and say we're there. And if you do the math, it turns out that it would actually have cost more to fake it than to actually do it. Um, it's really hard for 400,000 people to keep a secret for 50 years, especially in Washington. Um, and of course, the astronauts did leave these laser retroreflectors on the moon. You can see a picture of one here. When we fire a laser pulse at the moon, sure enough, the light bounces back off of these reflectors in exactly two and a half seconds, just the amount of time it would take for light to travel to the moon and back. Hard to fake that. And in 2015, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a spaceship orbiting the moon just 60 miles over the surface, took pictures of all of the Apollo hardware left on the moon, including the tracks and footprints of the astronauts. But if you don't believe me, then you just have to believe these guys, because they say we did it. The Mythbusters never lie. In 2008, they did a show called Mythbusters Tackle Moon Hoax Claims, and I think you'll find it very entertaining and convincing as well. 20 seconds and counting. So let's take a look at the Apollo 11 launch itself. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Let's return for a moment to the um, days at the end of the 1950s when the Cold War was really beginning to ramp up. Uh, at the end of World War II, the United States was the only nuclear power, developing the atomic bomb and later the hydrogen bomb. But in 1952, Russia matches that with their own hydrogen bomb, and the Cold War balance of power is in full play. We each had ICBMs, or intercontinental ballistic missiles, aimed at each other over the North Pole. We had about 30 minutes of warning for that, and mutual annihilation being possible generated the, the political uh, technique called mutual assured destruction. <laughs> um, 
But in 1957, Russia achieves orbital velocity with one of their ICBMs and uses that to launch Sputnik, the first object made by man to ever orbit the Earth. These are some pictures of several of the ICBMs developed by either the United States or Russia. And it was from this technology that we evolved into the technology that was able to take us to the moon. When President Kennedy was elected in 1960, the United States was busy attempting to place a man into orbit around Earth. We began that process by launching Alan Shepard into a suborbital flight in 1961. And soon after that, President Kennedy delivered a speech at Rice University in which he made the statement, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. This triggered our race to the moon with the Russians. And soon after that, Gus Grissom achieved the first, the second suborbital flight. Uh, Yuri Gagarin was the first person, a Russian, to orbit the earth. And in 1962, John Glenn was the first American to orbit the earth and the race to the moon was on. America's journey into space began with the Mercury capsule. The Mercury capsule was a one-man capsule with life support systems in it, uh, communications, uh, the ability to uh, steer itself in space with thrusters and uh, retro rockets to slow down to return to Earth. Uh, it carried Alan Shepard on the first suborbital flight in 1961, and it carried John Glenn in the first orbital flight around Earth in 1962. It's also just big enough for one granddaughter, my granddaughter, to fit in this mock-up of the capsule over down at, at Kennedy Space Center. Our journey into space continued with the two-man capsule called Gemini, Project Gemini from 1965 to 1966. And the goals of Project Gemini were to extend the missions to make sure that people could survive in space for the three days that it would take to get to the moon and the three days it would take to get back, to practice spacewalks, and also to practice rendezvous and docking, where the spaceship would be asked to approach and dock with another uh, spacecraft in orbit also around the Earth. The third and final stage of our journey to the moon was achieved using the Apollo capsule. This was the first three-man capsule capable of keeping three men alive all the way to the moon, uh, one person in orbit around the moon while two descended to the surface of the moon, and a uh, three-day journey back to Earth. Um, of course, during the construction and testing of the Apollo capsule in January of 1967, uh, a terrible fire took the lives of three astronauts, Ed White, Gus Grissom, and Roger Chaffee. Uh, due to faulty construction uh, inside the electrical wiring of the capsule. This occurred on the pad during a test. They were not in space. They were on Earth sitting on top of a rocket uh, being tested. Uh, it resulted in a complete delay in the program and a complete reworking of the internals of the Apollo command module, which uh, very likely saved many more astronauts' lives due to the fact that the quality was greatly improved after this terrible tragedy. The first manned flight of the Apollo capsule was in 1968. And of course, in July of 1969, uh, Apollo 11, the first moon landing, was, was achieved with an Apollo capsule. Uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, descending to the surface of the moon, with Mike Collins remaining aboard this, the command module in orbit around the moon. Aboard the um, Apollo 11 lunar module um, was a negative containing a photograph of the signatures of many of the 400,000 people who worked on the Apollo program over its lifetime. Um, their signatures remain on the moon. And they were placed there uh, on the surface of the moon by the Apollo astronauts as they left the lunar module. Here you can see just a few of those 400,000 people um, manning the consoles in the firing room two for the uh, monitoring of the launch and ascent 
of Apollo 12 from Earth into orbit around Earth and then on its way to the moon. Uh, one of the uh, most interesting and I think useful side effects of the Apollo program was uh, the use of these project charts which graphed out the dependencies between each of the steps in the program letting you know which steps were on what was called the critical path those steps which were gating the completion date or launch date of the project um, this pro this technique uh, had been used by the Air Force for many years and it was brought forward and improved by the Apollo um, mission planners to make sure that all of these multiple people and uh, companies that were building parts for the Apollo uh, spaceship or the lunar module or the command module um, were on the right schedule and that everybody was going to deliver their goods to the right place at the right time to make sure we could launch on time. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale of this project, here's a photograph of the Saturn V rocket at 363 feet, taller than either Big Ben or the Statue of Liberty, including its base. Truly a giant, giant achievement. During the planning for the mission, there were several different profiles discussed. Um, the first one that was looked at was called direct ascent. Basically, build a rocket big enough that you could launch it from Earth, send it to the moon, land it on the moon, launch it from the moon back to Earth, land it on the Earth, and have the astronauts climb down and uh, complete their mission. Very, very difficult to do that because obviously um, this rocket would be so large that it would actually be hard to imagine how the astronauts could get down from the capsule at the top to the surface of the moon uh, uh, or even see the moon as they were landing it um, while they were looking up into space. Uh, it was also extremely difficult to consider how to build a rocket this big. Uh, the second profile that was looked at was called Earth Orbit Rendezvous, where this giant rocket would be built in parts on Earth and then pieces of it would be launched separately into space into orbit around Earth. It would be assembled in orbit around Earth and leave for Moon from the Earth orbit. It, it, it had some advantages, but it also had the same disadvantages of how do you actually land a rocket that big backwards on the Moon. Uh, the profile that was eventually chosen was called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. Essentially, this says that the part of the rocket ship that brings the astronauts down to the surface of the moon should be as, as small and lightweight as possible. Uh, it was eventually determined that this would be called the Lunar Module or the Lunar Excursion Module. Uh, and basically, it allowed the two vehicles to be customized for different jobs. But it did have this challenge of after the astronauts launched from the surface of the moon back into orbit, how could they rendezvous with the command module to bring them back to Earth? Nothing like this had ever been done or even contemplated before, and it was quite a challenge. As I mentioned, um, adopting the lunar orbit rendezvous profile for the mission gave uh, this tremendous advantage. It allowed each of these two spacecraft to be developed for very different individual jobs. The command module seen on the left here, its job is to keep the three men alive, get them from Earth to the moon, get them from the moon back to Earth, and survive re-entry into Earth's atmosphere at about 25,000 miles per hour. Uh, compare that with the job of the lunar module. Leave lunar orbit, land on the moon, keep two men alive, launch back to orbit with uh, some lunar samples, rocks, several hundred pounds, rendezvous with the command module, and then be abandoned in space. You'll notice that the lunar module on the right shows no attempt to be aerodynamic or streamlined because it will never operate in an atmosphere of any kind. The moon has no atmosphere at all, and so the lunar module, variously called a bug or a spider, could essentially operate without concern over uh, wind shear or uh, any kind of aerodynamic requirements. Uh, this also allowed a single Saturn V to launch the entire mission and greatly improved our chances of achieving the goal that President Kennedy had set out by the end of the decade. It then turned out that the second vehicle with its own propulsion system, oxygen supply, and power supply allowed them to come up with this uh, lifeboat contingency, 
uh, you know, what if the command module uh, broke in some way? Uh, the, the men could climb into the lunar module and stay alive. This is exactly what happened on Apollo 13, and it was the extra uh, oxygen and power supplies in the lunar module that allowed the, the astronauts in Apollo 13 to make it back to Earth safely. Uh, the Apollo command module had to survive several uh, uh, tests of its ability to withstand hitting the ocean under three parachutes. Um, the, as, it, as you'll see here, the initial uh, designs weren't quite strong enough. This would have been a terrible way to return to Earth after surviving the trip all the way back from the moon. So uh, a redesign definitely was required. The Saturn V rocket consisted of three stages. Um, the first stage was a fairly traditional stage with five giant rocket engines that burned a mixture of kerosene and liquid oxygen. The second and third stages were called cryogenic stages because they burned a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Uh, much more difficult to manage, but gives you much more thrust per pound of fuel. So uh, the second and third stages um, were the first engines that were capable of being restarted in space in the space program. The lead engineer of the Saturn V program was, of course, Werner von Braun. Um, he's here, seen here standing next to one of the first stage uh, Saturn V with five giant F1 engines. Uh, the outer four engines were steerable in order to keep the rocket on the steady course, and the center engine was fixed. Each of these rocket engines generated 1.5 million pounds of thrust for a total of 7.5 million pounds of thrust, which was enough to lift the 6.5 million pound rocket off the pad and start it getting launched into space. Here's another picture of a family standing next to the first stage with its five giant F1 engines. Um, Charles Lindbergh visited the Apollo 11 astronauts before they left for the moon. Uh, and the night before, they were having dinner together, and he, uh, he was hearing some of the statistics about fuel usage like you see here. And he mentioned to the astronauts that in the first second after lighting these engines, the five engines used more fuel than he used on his entire trip across the Atlantic Ocean the first time flying solo. Uh, many of the pieces were so big they couldn't be transported by rail or air. Um, this second stage is being brought to the Cape by barge from the Michaud uh, assembly facility just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. And here you can see where that piece of hardware actually fits into the stack. At about 30 miles of altitude, the first stage is discarded. Its fuel is exhausted at this point. And the second stage engines take over the five uh, J1 engines that are cryogenically fueled. And here, here you can see it uh, at the base of the stack that's continuing on into orbit around Earth. This is an actual movie of the second stage being uh, ejected from the third stage. Uh, you can see the uh, small motors firing to pull the two apart. And then the third stage engine ignites and continues to put the astronauts into orbit around Earth. This uh, amazing footage was actually taken in a film camera, which was ejected at 200,000 feet and then recovered after it parachuted back to Earth. Upon leaving Earth orbit, this is the configuration that we had. The third stage engine is restartable and it restarts and sends the spacecraft from Earth orbit on its way to the moon. The lunar module is stored in, inside the nose of the rocket here. Uh, the astronauts are up here at the end inside the command module. The three astronauts are inside this part here. This part here is called the service module. It contains another restartable rocket engine, fuel, oxygen supplies, fuel cells, 
uh, everything that the astronauts needed to survive all that time in space. And it stays attached to the command module all the way to the moon during the entire orbital period around the moon and all the way back home. It's only jettisoned from the command module just before they re-enter Earth's atmosphere. These are the three rocket engines that actually went to the moon. The service propulsion system here on the left was attached to the service module and it was used to slow down when they reached the moon to be captured into lunar orbit and to speed up to leave the moon's orbit to head back to Earth. Uh, the lunar module descent system was the rocket engine that was in the bottom of the lunar module that was used to land on the moon and then this tiny engineer, the uh, lunar module ascent propulsion system, was used to actually bring the astronauts back up off the surface of the moon and rendezvous with the command module so they could transfer into the command module and come back to Earth. Um, this engine could not be tested before it was actually flown because the propellants were so um, corrosive that the lifetime of this engine was measured in just weeks after it had been f fired. Uh, therefore, it had to be uh, built to the highest specifications and have the fewest possible moving parts. So it really only had four moving parts, two valves for fuel and oxidizer and two backup valves to do the same thing. And it could be operated electrically or manually. All the astronauts had to do was open those valves. The two fuel components would mix, ignite by themselves, and launch the spacecraft into orbit around the moon. Once the astronauts fired the third stage rocket engine again to get themselves out of Earth orbit on a trajectory to the moon, which you can see here, they actually had to launch themselves aiming at a place in space where the moon was going to be in three days when they got there. Uh, once they were safely on their way to the moon, they had three days. And so what they did was uh, separate from the uh, third stage, uh, uncover the lunar module, turn around, come back, dock with the lunar module, and then extract the lunar module from the third stage where it had been safely stored during launch and or lunar orbit insertion. This video shows the um, workmen at Grumman Aerospace um, stacking the lunar module, the service module lunar adapter, and the command module um, getting ready for launch. The lunar module's inside, they're lowering that uh, careful protective cone over it, and now the, the command module and the service module will be lowered on top of that, uh, getting the whole stack ready to uh, launch to, into space. This uh, giant black ring is called the instrumentation unit. Um, it's very heavy, but it served several purposes. It contains computers which uh, would be able to guide the um, spacecraft into orbit, even if something went wrong with the computers in the command module. It also served as a strong point so that the rocket could be attached firmly to the launch platform before launch so that it wouldn't be blown over by the wind. The lunar module and the command module were held together by uh, this uh, device called a docking probe. You can see it right here. Um, it's got two components, and when the two spacecraft approached each other, the probe would enter here, and these, this part would latch on to the uh, inner part of the probe uh, of the the docking cone up here and pull the two spacecraft tightly together to make an airtight seal so that the astronauts could then climb through this uh, tunnel back and forth between the command module and the uh, and the lunar module. Uh, unfortunately this device fills up the entire tunnel but it was designed so that after it was used different latches would hold the spacecraft together and then this device could be disassembled and removed from the the, the tunnel so the astronauts could actually get past it and go back and forth between the two 
And here you see the configuration after docking and lunar module extraction. The command module here is attached to the lunar module here by the docking collar and the docking latches. The uh, docking cone has been, the docking adapter mechanism has been removed and the astronauts can now move back and forth through the tunnel between these two, uh, these two areas of the spacecraft. Uh, you can see here there were several phases to this uh, mission. Um, there was the uh, initial insertion into Earth orbit here, giving them some time to check out all the systems. After several orbits, they would launch to the moon by relighting the third stage. And they would, of course, launch to the place where the moon was going to be in several days. On the back of the moon, they would fire the service propulsion system engine to slow down enough so that the moon would capture them into orbit. There was one burn that would slow them down like this, and then a second burn to circularize the orbit. So they would stay in orbit about 60 miles above the moon. Then at some point when they were ready, they would two astronauts would enter the lunar module, and they would descend to the surface of the moon, touch down, and perform their mission there. At the end of their mission, they would launch back into orbit and orbit the moon several times, at which time they rendezvous with the command module. Uh, once the astronauts transferred back into the command module and with all their rocks and, and so on, um, they would fire the service propulsion engine one more time and depart the moon uh, for the long coast back to Earth, at which point they would enter the Earth's atmosphere at about 25,000 miles an hour, slow down with the heat shield, and then finally parachutes and land in the water recovery somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. When you're floating in space, it's obviously very difficult to know in which direction to fire a rocket engine to either speed up or slow down. This unit, called the Initial Inertial Measurement Unit, was developed at MIT, and it has in it three gyroscopes, which, con which constrain an internal platform to be fixed with respect to the stars. As the spaceship rotated and spun around this platform, the electronics in this unit would tell the astronauts in exactly which direction their spacecraft was pointing so that when they wanted to slow down, they could be sure that the engine was pointed exactly forward and that the thrust would be directed in the right direction in order to slow them down. The spider-like lunar module was developed by the Grumman Corporation uh, in Bethpage, Long Island. Um, I visited the site of their uh, former facilities. There's nothing really left there except for the historical archive building, which uh, I was able to visit, and you'll see some pictures from there in a moment. But this plaque was erected to uh, honor the fact that uh, this city of Bethpage and this site was uh, the site where the lunar modules were developed. And every lunar module that landed men on the moon, all six of them, were developed and built, designed, built, tested, and and uh, and shipped from Bethpage, Long Island, here to uh, Kennedy Space Center, where they were launched into space. Here you see a picture of the interior of the Grumman History Center in Bethpage, which you can visit if you call them in advance. Um, Grumman was really specialized in building aircraft for the Navy. Um, there are lots and lots of photographs here of their early designs. Um, but of course, uh, when I looked on the wall and I saw a photograph, a uh, big poster of all of the uh, products that have been developed by Grumman over the years, you see all these uh, Navy planes and aircraft uh, vehicles, refueling vehicles, fighters, water launch uh, vehicles, everything you see. And then down here in the 60s, this crazy looking thing here, uh, the lunar module. Doesn't look like anything else they ever, they ever constructed but uh, it brought Grumman into the uh, world of the space race. The uh, award of the contract to build the lunar module was the last major contract awarded in the Apollo program. So uh, not only did uh, the Grummies, the, the Grumman engineers have to uh, scramble to really catch up, um, most of the extra weight that had been uh, 
kept in reserve uh, for uh, unforeseen circumstances had been uh, claimed by the other manufacturers who were building the uh, Saturn V rocket engines, the uh, third, first, second, and third stages, the service module, and the command module. So keeping the weight of the lunar module down was a major challenge during the entire construction and design project. The lunar module was different than anything that had ever been built before. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was the first true space vehicle with no concern about atmospheric drag or aerodynamics, and it reversed the typical concept of a rocket. A rocket typically has to go up and then come down. The lunar module worked in reverse. Its first job was to go down to the surface of the moon and then come back up into space. And the part that landed on the moon had to serve as the launch platform for the part that launched back into space. And in spite of the fact that there were 5,000 people checking out every bit of the rocket before it left Earth, the launch on the moon had to be performed by two guys with no help from the ground. There had to be one button that said launch, and it had to work every time. The requirements for the lunar module were truly amazing. Um, it had to be small enough to fit inside the Saturn V um, service module lunar adapter stage, about 13 feet in diameter. Um, it had to keep two men alive for the 45 hours they would be on the surface of the moon, descend safely to the lunar surface, contain enough oxygen to pressurize and depressurize the cabin enough so that there could be several entries and exits, then ascend safely into lunar orbit and find rendezvous and dock with the command module. And the whole thing had to weigh less than 33,500 pounds here on Earth before launch. The lunar module went through many different iterations of design from looking a lot like a helicopter to eventually looking like the object that you saw earlier. And here's a photograph that I was able to find in the archives of President Kennedy visiting one of the plants where the lunar modules were being constructed next to a mock-up of, of the lunar module. And you'll notice that it has uh, huge windows like a helicopter um, and chairs for the astronauts to sit in. They were eliminated due to weight concerns very quickly. And this is the final configuration of the lunar module. The descent stage, which is this entire lower half here, contains rocket engines, a rocket engine to bring them down to the surface, the descent engine, fuel for the descent engine, an oxidizer, oxygen tanks to keep the astronauts alive here, um, a helium tank to pressurize the fuel tanks, the four legs, to land on the surface, a ladder so the astronauts can descend to the surface after they land there. And it also serves as the launch pad for the ascent engine. This is the little motel room where the astronauts will actually live while they're on the moon. Um, it contains uh, enough oxygen and uh, water to uh, keep them alive only for the time that they're descending to the surface, sitting on the surface, and coming back up. Every part of the lunar module was constructed by engineers and craftsmen with decades of experience. Um, every part had to be configured perfectly. Nothing could be drilled twice. Weight was a huge problem. Configuration, control, and cleanliness were critically important. Here you can see on the left a craftsman heating up a big disk of titanium and actually manipulating it into a fuel tank by hand. This was the only way that most of this material could be actually constructed back in the 60s. Finally, the uh, ascent and descent stages were assembled to each other, uh, and that completed the assembly of the entire lunar module at which point it was packaged up for shipment to the Cape to be launched. And here you see Walter Cronkite on the lower left holding a model of the lunar module. 
as I mentioned, um, one of the concerns about weight was solved by eliminating the seats. So the astronauts actually landed on the moon standing up. Um, the arrow points to these uh, harnesses on their spacesuits where uh, little retractable springs would keep them firmly fixed on the floor uh, so they could look out the windows and actually uh, land uh, the spaceship on the surface of the moon safely. Here's a picture of the lunar module under construction before all of its uh, protective shielding was applied. Uh, most of the electronics were stored outside the lunar module uh, on, on an electronics rack out here. Um, fuel tanks, oxygen tanks, and so on were all uh, along the bottom. And the astronauts themselves actually lived inside in, in the ascent stage. Um, there were several antennae to communicate with Earth like here and here, uh, but um, it was very cramped quarters uh, and just enough to keep the astronauts alive during their trip down and back up to the to the command module. In this image inside the lunar module descent stage, you can see how many plumbing, electrical, and control wires had to be routed accurately and correctly to make this project a success. When I visited the Cradle of Aviation Museum on Long Island where the uh, lunar module from Apollo 18 that did not launch is displayed, uh, I met this gentleman, Tony Leone, a retired Grumman engineer who told me that some of his parts went to the moon. He actually designed several of the uh, coolant pipes that were uh, uh, carried coolant from one place in the lunar module to another and uh, I asked him you know if it was scary or worrisome he said no I was young and and uh, I, I thought I could do anything they told me to design some parts so I did when I went down into the basement of the uh, uh, Grumman uh, History Museum they had uh, a whole collection of spare parts and one of the spare parts was the um, Lunar Module Alignment Optical Telescope that was used to obtain the star positions to uh, calibrate the inertial measurement unit. And I was able to actually pick up and hold the flight spare that would have been used if something had gone wrong with the one that was in the, in the lunar module itself. Um, and you can see uh, uh, the, here that the, this little black handle is uh, shows you is right here on, on the model of the spacecraft. Uh, by looking through this eyepiece, the astronauts could center a crosshairs on a particular star, and then they would push these buttons, uh, Mark 1 and Mark 2, and that would tell the inertial measurement unit exactly where the spacecraft was pointing, and that was enough to recalibrate its orientation in space. It, uh, it might be said that the entire goal of the lunar uh, landing project and the Apollo project was to light this blue light labeled lunar contact. When one of the legs of the lunar module touched the surface of the moon, this light would come on and that was a signal for the astronauts to shut off the engine uh, so that the engine bell would not get so close to the surface or even contact the surface that there would be back pressure built up in it and it could possibly blow up. So when this light went on, you'll hear the uh, lunar module pilot, um, in this case Buzz Aldrin, um, say to, uh, to Neil Armstrong, engine stop, contact light, engine stop, and then they'll drop the last four, five, six feet to the moon for a successful soft landing. I wanted to talk a bit also about the Apollo guidance computers. There were two identical computers, one in the command module and one in this lunar module. Each of them was uh, accessed by the astronauts through a display keyboard unit. You can see an example of that down here in the lower right. The programs were stored not on disk drives because they really hadn't been invented yet, but on these wire ropes. And these wire ropes uh, were passed either through or around these tiny cores of magnetic um, ferrite, iron. Um, a wire that passed through the core was a 1, and a wire that passed around the core was a 0. And the computer could read its programs from these long wires 
through uh, an interface to this box containing these programs. But the programs themselves had to be actually physically sewn into these wires um, by, uh, I guess what you would call, uh, not programmers, but essentially people who spent their day uh, sewing other products uh, like spacesuits. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, after the programs were written, uh, these women sewed these tiny wires back and forth through these little metal cores, carefully following the instructions generated by the programmers. As a result, the programs could not be changed very easily once they were sewn into these uh, ropes, as they called them. So the programmers had to do all of their testing, and then once they finished their testing and sent their programs off to be loaded into these rope uh, cores, uh, there was really no way to change them at all. So the pressure was really on the programmers to make no mistakes at all. Um, each computer had about uh, 4,000 words of memory when it was originally designed. Um, soon it was uh, determined that that was way too small an amount of memory to hold all the programs required for launch, navigation, coasting to the moon, entry into the lunar orbit, descent to the surface, launch back to the lunar module, to, to the dis, uh, uh, service module and uh, command module, um, coast back to Earth and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. All those needed separate programs. So eventually, um, 36,000 words uh, of storage were available. Some of them were permanent. Uh, in other words, they were non-volatile. If the power went off, they would stay, they would retain their values. And others were volatile. If the power went off, in that case, they would be reset to zeros. Interestingly, in the original Apollo statement of work, the word software does not even appear. Uh, there was no concept that digital computers would be operating the, the spacecraft and calculating its navigational uh, uh, directions. Uh, eventually, over 400 people were employed writing this code and, and testing it and then implementing it into the rope cores and eventually into the command module and the service module. This is one of the few videos I ever found of an astronaut actually operating the DISCI or display keyboard unit that allowed them to interface with the computers. The uh, ground support people would radio up to them um, information about the exact position of the spacecraft, and they would be able to enter that on the keyboard and tell the computer exactly where they were so that the computer, in conjunction with that inertial measurement unit, would be able to direct them for the next phase of their mission. However, the computers aboard the spaceship were, of course, not the only computers that were available. In the basement of the uh, Houston uh, Manned Space Center, there were IBM computers, uh, an entire bank of uh, mainframes, available to run simulations, calculate trajectories, and serve as backups uh, in case of problems aboard the spacecraft as well. If you have a chance to visit the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Garden City, Long Island, in New York, you'll be able to see uh, Lunar Module Number 13. It was prepared for Apollo Mission Number 19, which was canceled along with Mission 18 and 20. Um, and uh, rather than being scrapped, it was decided to make it available for people to observe. So this, other than fuel and batteries and oxygen and things like that in the tanks, this uh, lunar module is completely ready to be uh, operated in lunar orbit and bring two astronauts down to the surface of the moon and back up to the space uh, craft orbiting the moon, the command module. Down here in the, at the bottom, you can see the, be the exhaust bell from the descent engine which brought the uh, astronauts out of orbit and down to the surface. Um, buried inside here is the exhaust bell of the ascent engine, 
And this, of course, is the part of the spacecraft in which the astronauts lived, breathed, um, and slept and ate while they were on the surface of the moon. It was determined soon um, after uh, design that the, the lunar module needed to be insulated from not only the heat of the sun, but also from micrometeoroids uh, that might be zipping through space and could possibly puncture a tank and put the lives of the astronauts at risk. So this is an example of the multiple layer lunar module insulation. There are layers of kapton, layers of gold foil, um, mylar with uh, gold evaporated onto it and so on. So all of this would be able to stop the heat of the sun and any, a certain number of micrometeoroid strikes that might uh, might have aborted the mission and endangered the lives of the astronauts. Many, many thousands of people worked on the lunar module, not all of them at Grumman, but at multiple contractors who supplied parts and subsystems for the mission as well. Uh, many of them signed a poster uh, that was circulated around to all the subcontractors and the Grumman locations. And a copy of this was, of course, left on the moon. When I was able to visit the Grumman History Museum in Bethpage, Long Island, um, I went down into the basement and lo and behold, all of the original blueprints for building your own lunar module are available down here. Um, you can see I just opened one box. I have no idea what parts of the lunar module would have been able to be built from these blueprints, but they're all hand-drawn, kept in these boxes, um, and uh, it looks to me like um, there might be just a subset of the requirements of building the entire lunar module, but uh, you can see my sunburned Arizona feet uh, absorbing this incredible view of the original blueprints that allowed us them to build these lunar modules. In the uh, Grumman History Museum, you can also see examples of parts of the um, lunar module. Um, in this case, we have the crushable shock absorber in the upper left. These shock absorbers were built into the legs of the lunar module, and the idea was that uh, these were one-time use shock absorbers. They would start out tall like this, and as the lunar module uh, landed on the ground, they would crush down and absorb the shock because they only needed to be used once, so they were one-time use crushable shock absorbers. Uh, and they, they would absorb the shock. And um, it turned out that Neil Armstrong landed the lunar module so softly on the surface that these shock absorbers were hardly crushed at all, m meaning that uh, it required quite a jump from the bottom step of the ladder down to the surface of the moon um, because the, uh, the lunar module was a bit farther from the surface than it was thought to be based upon the ability of these lunar module crushable shock absorbers to collapse to a certain degree. When the uh, design of the lunar module landing pads was uh, considered, no one really knew if the dust on the moon was so thick that the lunar module might land and then simply sink out of sight in some huge amount of dust. And there were scientists who predicted that this might be the case. So the lunar module landing pads were made oversized for the first couple of missions just to make sure that did not happen. And you can see here a picture in the upper right of me holding an example of one of the lunar module landing pads at the Grumman History Museum. Um, enormous, enormous things. Of course, they were able to cut these down to smaller size and save some weight on later missions when it was determined that we would not, uh, the moon was not covered with a layer of dust so thick that the lunar module would just sink out of sight with the astronauts aboard. Uh, when the um, ascent stage um, was uh, instructed to fire its engine and take the astronauts off the moon and back into orbit, all of the connections between the ascent stage and the descent stage had to be severed at that same instant. There were uh, explosive guillotine um, devices that would cut all the tubes, but uh, all of the electric connections went through this connector, and this was an explosive connector. Um, when the proper signal was given through this little connector here, um, explosive charges inside of this connector would fire and sever all of these wires that had been connecting the um, ascent stage to the descent stage and allow the astronauts to take off safely into space.
Here you can see the lunar module ascent and descent stages arriving at Kennedy Space Center for checkout, having been uh, carried in on the uh, giant Guppy um, spacecraft, um, one of the largest cargo carrying spacecrafts in the world. I mean, uh, air aircraft in the world. So um, the Apollo missions followed a set timeline. And each mission attempted to do things that hadn't been done before in order to make sure that all the procedures for the final landing on the moon would work. Apollo 8 was the first mission to actually reach the moon and go into orbit around the moon. Uh, because there was no lunar module available, the testing uh, had taken too long and the lunar module was not ready. Apollo 8 didn't carry a lunar module at all, but they did manage to test the procedures for getting to the moon and going into orbit around the moon in the command module. So in December 1968, um, this was the first manned orbits of the moon. Um, they orbited the moon 10 times, our first human view of the far side of the moon. During this mission, Bill Anders took the famous Earthrise photo that you see here on the right, um, which Carl Sagan made uh, famous with his book, The Pale Blue Dot. And of course, you might remember that the uh, astronauts read from Genesis on Christmas Eve um, in an attempt to basically tie together, you know, the three main religions on Earth, um, generating some controversy, but uh, I thought um, appropriately um, connecting all of us together on that little tiny blue dot. Um, by the time Apollo 9 was ready to launch, the first lunar module was in fact ready. And so in March 69, Apollo 9 launched into Earth orbit and um, practiced all the procedures for getting the lunar module out of the third stage, docking with it, undocking with it, testing its engines, its computers, and so on. All the tests were successful and the lunar module was ready to bring people to the moon. Uh, Apollo 10 was the get the last mission before actually landing on the moon. In May 69, it uh, launched from Kennedy Space Center, went all the way to the moon, went into orbit, just like Apollo 8 did. Um, detached the lunar module with two astronauts in, on board, uh, descended to 10 miles above the surface, almost to the point of landing, but not quite checked out the Apollo 11 proposed landing site, and then jettisoned the descent stage, fired the SN engine, climbed back up into orbit, rendezvous with the command module, basically to test every phase of the mission except landing on the moon. And here is an okay, example we the lab, the, uh, of Buzz Aldrin actually going the into the lunar module to check it out the before separating. Yeah, do we copy? The Lunar Module Eagle was again given a thorough checkout to ensure the functioning of all systems as Armstrong and Aldrin prepared to seal themselves off from Collins in the command module and for the two craft to pull apart. So Apollo 11 has now arrived in orbit around the moon, and here we see a video of the lunar module separating from the command module with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin aboard and getting ready to begin its descent to the moon. In this picture, you can see the lunar module uh, appearing upside down from the perspective of the uh, command module, but of course in the weightlessness of space, there's no right side up or upside down at all. Uh, Apollo's lunar module descent trajectory down to the lunar surface uh, involved multiple phases. Most of the time the astronauts were ending up looking straight up into space. Um, they would fire the engine in a forward direction to slow them down. They would follow this black line here as they got closer and closer to the surface. And then finally, right around here, they would pitch over into a vertical position. And this was the first time that the astronauts could actually see uh, their landing site. So at this point, uh, Neil Armstrong took over uh, command of the descent from the computer.
uh, because he noticed that the computer was taking them to an area with some very large boulders which could possibly have tipped over the spacecraft and would have s stranded the astronauts on the moon at that point. So he took over manual control and flew the spacecraft beyond that area of boulders to a flatter area where they could land safely. Using the original uh, descent trajectory that I showed in the last slide used more fuel. It would have used less fuel in, if they had come in on a straight line just like this, but the disadvantage of this was that they would not have been able to see the surface until the very last moment. And as we saw in, in the actual event, it was important to see the surface from a high enough elevation that they could take over control from the computer and fly to a place that was actually safe to land. Telcom, go. GNC, go. Econ, go. Surgeon, go. So here's the actual go landing of Apollo 11 on the moon. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. This is filmed through the right. window of the lunar module. This is the voice of Buzz Aldrin feet, telling Neil Armstrong and about forward. his position and on, elevation. Forward. Forward. 40 feet down, two and a half. Here Picking you can see a dust. little bit of dust shooting out from the uh, descent engine. Four forward, drift into the right and there's the shadow of the, of the leg. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And here in this video, you can see Neil Armstrong heading down the ladder to be the first human on the moon. Of course, uh, we all remember the famous words spoken by Neil Armstrong on the moon, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. And here's Walter Cronkite gazing at the Daily News front page, Man Lands on the Moon. Here's a photo of Buzz Aldrin preparing to back out of the lunar module hatch, climb down the same ladder and join Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon. Apollo 11, along with all of the other Apollo missions, um, not only collected rocks and samples and observed the geology of the moon, but also left scientific instruments on the moon. Um, several of those are visible in these photographs. Um, there was a surface science package, magnetometers, uh, and in particular, um, a, um, a seismometer to measure moon quakes, which were very successful and, and operated in each case for several months. Up in orbit around the moon, um, Mike Collins in the command module was not idle. He was busy taking photographs of the moon and collecting scientific data, uh, not only to uh, observe potential future landing sites for the upcoming missions, but also to simply do science on the surface of the moon. This is one of my favorite photos that he took where in which you can see 
in, in this case, you've got these giant mountain ranges casting these long shadows uh, across the surface of the moon based upon the low um, sun angle at this particular time. Um, on later missions, uh, General Motors and Boeing together developed the Lunar Roving Vehicle, uh, LRV, uh, a battery-powered car that allowed the astronauts to greatly increase the range that they could use to explore around the lunar module. Um, this car amazingly fit into one of the bays, the unused bays in the base the descent stage of the lunar module. And in this video down here, you can actually see the car self-assembling itself. All the astronauts had to do was pull a lanyard and the car popped out, assembled itself using springs and wires and was basically ready to drive off in as soon as it came down onto the ground. Here is one of the rocks that might have been a little too big to bring home. For a sense of scale, uh, you can see over here, our lunar rover. The astronauts named this House Rock for obvious reasons. After the astronauts uh, left the surface of the moon, um, they had to re-rendezvous, of course, with the lunar, with the uh, command module that had been staying in orbit about 60 miles above the surface of the moon. So here's a video taken from the command module, and, and here you can see the lunar module approaching, uh, coming up from the surface. And this is the lunar orbit rendezvous that was so concerning to scientists when the early mission planning was going on. They thought, how could this tiny craft ever launch from the moon and re-rendezvous with the command module in order to safely come back to Earth? Well, they figured it out and it worked every time. In, uh, on our final mission to the moon, Apollo 17, the lunar rover vehicle was parked about a mile away and the camera was pointed at the lunar module. The astronauts then walked over to the lunar module, climbed in and got and prepared to leave the moon. In this video, you'll actually see how the um, astronauts launched from the moon and the and controllers back on Earth were able to send commands to the lunar rover vehicle to tilt the camera up to actually follow the astronauts into space. So let's, let's watch how that happened. Four days, push. Engine arm is asking. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded. Three, two, one. Ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your good. Ag side. Right here you have good thrust. Uh, remember, the engine okay. that brought them up seconds. off the surface your number. had Stay never been able to be tested. And it was the first good. time it had ever Roger, fired. Uh, we've lost data right now, but uh, we'll... We'd like aft on me, aft on me, please. Uh, on the upper right, you see the image uh, okay, up on taken from the right window the of in the LM cabin, right over here. Awful lot of static, Jack. We break lock? Yep. Why don't you get it on an army or something? Yeah, I got it on the army. Didn't get combat. Hello, Houston. How do you read? Roger, John here, you're loud and clear, and both systems okay. work good, you're right on the line. Should be about 145 and minus 47. See if we can get calm. I will. Now the um, lunar rover camera hey, has now been panned back down to the surface. 
And here you can see the descent stage. Challenger, you're clear to go in a few minutes. We'd like to control auto. Over. It served as the launch platform for the uh, for the ascent stage that took them into into space. Okay, you watch the table, Gino. I'm watching it. Just get calm as you can. <laughs> And here's a still photo of the lunar module approaching the command module with Earthrise in the background. Lunar orbit rendezvous having been completed successfully, the lunar module now approaches. The command module spins around and prepares itself for docking with the command module so the two astronauts can return to the command module with their um, important cargo of uh, samples of rocks from the moon. Uh, and then uh, eventually the lunar module will be detached and discarded and left in orbit around the moon, or in some cases it'll be uh, sent to crash into the moon to provide an artificial moon quake to be picked up by the lunar seismometers that were left on the moon. And here's an image of the actual docking. At that point, the astronauts were safe and ready to come back to Earth. And here you can see Gene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt on the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, dirty but very happy after completing their multiple extravehicular activities, or EVAs. Um, using uh, walking, using the Apollo lunar rover vehicle, and collecting tons and tons of information. Harrison Schmidt was actually the first and, on, and last and only geologist to, uh, to be sent to the moon. And uh, as a professional geologist, he was able to make a lot more uh, interesting and useful observations of lunar geology. Finally, with uh, all the rocks and the two astronauts back aboard the command module, the hatch was sealed and the lunar module could be cut adrift. No eagle, its task completed, could be cut adrift. Now, the lunar module in this case is going to be commanded to fire its engines and crash into the surface of the moon as I mentioned, to provide an artificial moon quake to test, uh, to measure information about the interior of the moon. Here's the part that comes back to Earth. We've got the um, command module um, up here in the front with the astronauts aboard. We've got the service module here that contains fuel and the service propulsion engine that will uh, actually take them out of lunar orbit and back to the Earth, and here's the engine bell from that service propulsion engine. As we approach the Earth, the service module is jettisoned, and this is the only part that actually returns into the Earth's atmosphere. This blunt end here is, of course, the heat shield that protects the astronauts from the heat of reentry as they approach, enter Earth's atmosphere at about 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, Reentry is a critical phase, and it has to be um, done at an angle that is uh, exactly right. If they come in at too steep an angle, they'll slow down too fast and burn up. If they come in at too shallow an angle, they'll skip off the Earth's atmosphere and be unable to return to the planet Earth at all. Um, that entry angle was about one degree wide, and so there was a lot of concern to make sure that they were on the right track when they came back towards Earth's atmosphere to make sure that they would enter at exactly the right angle. Once the spacecraft had slowed down enough, the parachutes opened and the astronauts headed down to the ocean for a hopefully soft landing on the water. Uh, although there was a big splash, the uh, command modules all survived this impact based upon their being strengthened after those tests that we saw earlier where they did not survive the impact with the water. The astronauts were um, lifted out of the command module um, from a Navy chopper after donning some biological isolation garments. 
there was some concern over whether there might be germs on the moon that would be uh, detrimental to humankind. So the astronauts donned uh, these garments and face masks. They were carried back to the um, to the USS Hornet, in this case on Apollo 11, after this uh, flotation collar was uh, applied to the spacecraft to keep it upright. Um, they were brought back to the uh, USS Hornet, they were quickly uh, brought to the deck, and then placed into uh, this um, isolation trailer to make sure that they would be in quarantine for several weeks, to make sure that they hadn't picked up any, any moon germs that might contaminate Earth. Of course, it was impossible to avoid that. If, uh, if they had brought back any moon germs, everybody on the ship and the pre President Nixon would have all been exposed to those germs anyway. But it was the best we could do at the time. Um, and now fast forward to 2015, uh, the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a spacecraft that's in orbit around the moon, uh, takes images of the moon and also takes images of all six of the actual landing sites of the six Apollo missions that uh, landed on the moon. You can see in this, in this still photo from about 60 miles altitude, the Eagle descent stage for Apollo 11. Uh, the tracks of Neil Armstrong walking over to this little west crater um, and the um, various equipment that they dumped out before taking off back to uh, back to Earth. So this is how mankind actually did get to the moon. Uh, a combination of all of these things, John F. Kennedy's vision and imagination, the 400,000 people who were totally committed to this success, the brave astronauts, the incredible engineers and uh, the craftsmen who built the spacecraft and the computers, um, some new technology that we still benefit today. Um, lots of redundancy at every possible level to make sure that there were always backups for every backup. Good project management, the US taxpayer, and not a small amount of luck. So I'll close with the images of the astronauts from all seven Apollo missions that went to the moon. Um, of course, six of them actually landed on the moon. Um, the Apollo 13 astronauts had that terrible explosion on the way to the moon and using the lunar module as a lifeboat were able to survive long enough to get back to Earth and just barely survive their trip, but they made it home alive. So we didn't lose any astronauts in space on any of these missions. Um, all the way through Apollo 17, the last mission that was actually sent to the moon. So thank you very much for watching and I appreciate your attention. Many thanks to our Galaxy sponsor, Toll Brothers. Our star sponsors are Shay Donnelly and McDonald's. Our planet sponsors are Paul's Ace Hardware and Republic Services. Our asteroid sponsors are the Fountain Hills Chamber of Commerce, Flying Flowers Butterfly Garden, Automotive Research, and the NPOA.